Today at shopdap.com, we'll be going over inspecting a used B7A4. Okay, so B7A4, these are gonna come in a variety of packages. This one, however, was a steal. $1,500, two liter turbo FSI engine. Uh, we're gonna be going over inspecting the total vehicle and then talk about why it was so cheap. It looks beautiful, it's in amazing shape. It runs, it drives, it has good tires on it. What could possibly be wrong that it would be $1,500? Well, this car has a CVT transmission. Now, if you're not familiar with CVT, CVT stands for continuously valueless transmission. CVT transmissions are essentially a large band that, that adjusts as you drive. So it doesn't shift like a normal transmission would, but it would change in RPM. It adjusts as you go. So if you were to peg the throttle to the floor, it can hold a steady RPM at a high RPM until you let off the throttle. So it will stay at a specific range. Now, a lot of manufacturers have tried CVT transmissions over the years. People universally hate them a tremendous amount. This one is no, no different. So this car is a great deal and is something that has a few issues, uh, notably fault codes and vibration under acceleration. The first thing you wanna do whenever you are looking to purchase a used car is to scan for faults. So we have our OBD11, which is a Volkswagen Audi specific scan tool. We have it with our phone and we're gonna get it plugged in and scan the vehicle. We did a full vehicle scan. We're not gonna make you wait through that, but we are gonna go into the transmission control module because that's where our interesting faults are. The fault we have on our car is transmission rain sensor A circuit range performance intermittent. This is almost certainly an electrical fault related to circuit board issues on the uh, electrical components inside this transmission. Now, this could be and certainly can be responsible for our issues with the drivability concern. We haven't diagnosed that, but it's likely to be the case. Most people think that if they're gonna erase the fault, which we can do, it's going to solve your problem. It is an intermittent fault. It certainly will erase, but eventually will likely come back. So uh, this is something we knew about with this vehicle and again, why it was so cheap. So uh, let's take a look at the rest of the car to see what kind of condition the rest of it's in. It's good to start by checking your wheels. So this car has good tires on it. You can look at your tread depth, make sure you don't have alignment issues. We're next gonna go look at the brakes and the overall condition of the components in the suspension. So these cars have four length suspension, which means they have two upper control arms, two lower control arms. That's going to be on both front driver's side and passenger side of the vehicle, which these potentially do have issues on these cars and can be a aware point. So it's something that you do want to inspect whenever you're dealing with pretty much all Audi A body cars have it or, or B body cars, which would be Audi A4, Audi A5, Audi A6 and Audi A A7 and A8 all use four link suspensions in the front of them. So we're gonna start by checking this tie rod and what we're gonna do is kind of wiggle this wheel and tire back and forth to see if we have play in these, in these joints. They actually look good. We're also gonna do kind of forward back. This is gonna tell us if we have wheel bearing play and you'll also see some potential movement in these joints. Now, these are the upper control arms. They can wear either back here at this bushing back here or in the joint here. So you will usually get a knocking noise if you have some, some issue with them, but you don't see any play within those. So those are good. Uh, and then you can inspect the inner bearing, the inner bushing, which in this particular vehicle, they have a little bit of cracking, a little bit of dry rot, but nothing, nothing to be majorly concerned about. You can look at the condition of the rotors. Uh, they do have some signs of wear here, but nothing that's exceptionally worn. There's a little bit of grooving here on this inner portion. Could be uh, related to uh, the pad wear of some kind. It does look like maybe these pads may have been not the correct ones. Uh, they do seem to be hanging over just a slight amount over the rotors here. And that's not normal for brake pads. Checking the condition of these brakes, they do look good. You do want to make sure that you look at the inner and the outer pad. The inner pad is always gonna have more wear than the outer pad, so you will wanna inspect that if possible, or you can remove the caliper completely. Uh, we have a variety of DIYs around brakes if, you, if you're looking for them. The rear pads on this car are good, and we're just gonna inspect to make sure you don't have any wear disparities between maybe drivers and passenger side or, or front to front to rear is gonna have a different split, but uh, in terms of left to right, you shouldn't have any variation between the two. This is supposed to be a CV boot, and now it's mostly just a CV cover because it doesn't hold any grease. So this is, is a thing that's supposed to be sealed up. It's gonna hold grease. It clearly has completely come apart and uh, has no longer 
been used as a CV boot. So we would have to replace that and either replace the whole axle or replace just a CV boot. Uh, we will probably elect to replace the boot. Now, if we look at the driver's side of our vehicle, you can look, we don't have any major wear issues with any of these. You do have some uh, bump stop wear here because this car is lowered on a uh, cup kit, has uh, new dampers and springs. Nothing, no wear that's concerned. Bump stops are not something I'm super worried about. So that's no big deal. No play in our tie rod ends. We do have something interesting though. Uh, the brake pads are exceptionally worn on this side in relative to the other side. So this is something that we have to address um, and we can take a look closer. So if you take a look here, you can see the excessive wear here relative to the other side. So we're gonna flash on the driver's side here and then the passenger side so you can see a comparison. On our driver's side CV, you can see this guy is broken right here. So it, this one's in better shape than the other one, but it also does need an inner CV boot. So that wear issue is generally gonna be an indication of binding within the caliper or the caliper slide. So in this case, I assume it's probably the caliper slides that need to be lubricated. It's possible the piston is stuck. So what we're gonna do in that circumstance is remove this brake caliper, see if we can push that piston and then see if we can get it to operate. And then we're also gonna lubricate the caliper slides to make sure that everything's moving the way it's supposed to. One thing you do wanna look for whenever you're looking at a car like this is we know this car was lowered. So we also do have aftermarket wheels with, I know they put Audi center caps into them, but these are not factory wheels. So whenever you're looking over a car like that, you wanna make sure that all of the mods that have been done on the car have been done properly, tastefully, and, uh, and not hacking the car together. So everything on this car is actually pretty solidly done uh, and it's not heavily modified. Now we're checking out the rear. Uh, there's nothing really to report back here. You are going to want to take something like a pry bar and you can kind of pry on some of these bushings to see if they have play on your lower control arms here and here. You can kind of just give it a little wiggle see if you have any movement there. Sway bar links to here. You can inspect the bushings. Same deal. Uh, you are going to want to check all over, over all this stuff. Nothing really of note in the rear. Now, another common thing you're going to find on most of these Audis is going to be a splash shield like this. But this one, as many are, is missing hardware. So this hardware for these is pretty expensive. You take it to a lot of like Jiffy Lube type places and they oftentimes will lose your hardware. So uh, you will wanna make sure you try to keep as much of it as possible or eventually improvise if you need to. Uh, obviously we can get you hardware, but these screws that are half turns are usually about, I think about five bucks each. Now that we're underneath our car, we're gonna inspect for leaks. So let's get a closer look. Usually it's best to start kind of in the front and then work your way backwards. What we're looking for is oil, coolant, anything of that nature. So oil is gonna be something that usually is clearly oily, but also oil when it leaks for an extended period of time will collect dirt on it. Coolant on the other hand on these cars is pink, which will often crystallize. So you'll see kind of a whitish pink crystals uh, and kind of white streaks running down things if you have a coolant leak present anywhere. Now here is our snub mount on our vehicle, but if you notice, you may not be able to see completely in there, but I'm gonna run my finger around there for you. There's no mount there. This is a piece of metal. It's supposed to have an orange mount that kind of sits in here and keeps everything from moving around. If you look down here, here's some pieces of what it used to be kind of floating around. This is actually the mount that keeps the engine from rocking up and down as, as the vehicle accelerates. So this actually could be responsible for quite a bit of movement in, in the engine compartment. Uh, when it happens. So this could actually end up banging probably if you let off the throttle hard uh, and on a car that had a manual, you just engage in the clutch might cause this thing to bang around. Here is our engine mount on the passenger side. If you see all of this kind of purplish juice, this is what I call berry juice. It's a common thing you would inspect for when you're looking at engine mounts on these cars, the older uh, VW and Audi models like this. This is a hydraulic mount that actually has busted and is leaking out the hydraulic juice. So these could be bad and may cause vibration. We're going to check that later on, but we know at least that this is an indication that something could be going on with them. Depends on how dire and how bad it feels as to how much you would need to replace this right away. Now we are going to take a look here just for general leaks. Uh, these are some of the turbo lines for the coolant and oil. Um, we don't see anything here. This is pretty dry and I would expect to see something potentially uh, leaking down here somewhere. So this is good news for this. Here's our driver's side engine mount. You can probably see this one a little bit better. It's not leaking quite as bad, but you can see kind of our juices are loose over here. Here we are looking at the oil filter housing. 
it does look like it's leaking a little bit. This could be just the seal within it, or it could be the housing itself. So sometimes these things age and crack. Uh, it also has a return valve in the bottom of it to drain the oil filter housing, which could be leaking internally. So we might need a new one of those. It's possible. Uh, well, we won't know that until we probably change the oil and see if it continues to leak after we clean everything up. Now we do have a little bit of, of what appears to be a little bit of an oil leak or residual from an oil leak down here. This is almost certainly from that oil filter housing. There's not a lot here. The only other place I'd be concerned about would be a rear main seal, which it would be right here and it'd be leaking uh, much more in, in this area. And it's mostly just on the bottom of the trans here. So I'd probably just blow by from driving the car with that leak, leaking oil filter housing. Now we're back down, we're gonna inspect the engine. Before we do that, we're gonna to try to t break torque the engine to see if we can get it to tweak to see how much movement we have from those damaged engine mounts. Okay. Oh, that's, that didn't sound good at all. That sounds like this transmission is, is kerfuffled. That is real bad news bears. Yeah. Did we just break this car? I might have just broken this car. We were gonna currently bail on our engine mount testing because if you heard that noise that just happened it's not good it's not good it's possible while trying to brake torque this thing i didn't really even brake torque it very much that the internals of this cvt constantly valueless trash transmission broke uh, since it's just a big chain it's possible something internally either stripped or damaged it didn't sound like a good noise um, so we're going to see if this thing drives after we're done with this while shooting this, I wasn't thinking particularly clearly, so we were trying to brake torque it with the wheels off, which is real dumb, and I'm gonna show you right, right now why. Start it up, yeah, start it up and then put it in drive. If you notice, the hub is turning and the rotor is not. The reason why is because without wheel bolts in there, all of the torque was on this tiny little set screw for the hub right here, for the brake rotor. So this snapped off and created that noise. Stupid me. Sometimes my genius is, it's almost frightening. Okay, so this engine's pretty basic. This is a cover right here that we're gonna pop off and you can take a look now. So this system is fairly simple and we are gonna look for common issues. So some of the common problems around FSIs, PCV valves, I can tell you from the manufacturer on this, this is an aftermarket PCV valve. So that's been replaced. Uh, the high pressure fuel pump is also a common problem. The cam follower inside of here is a common problem, which is often uh, something that's a maintenance item. People will often check it to make sure you don't have, destroy your camshaft on the intake side. Uh, it's something you wanna look for. Leaks around here, you also wanna take a look at, make sure you don't have any leaks. Valve cover gasket can leak. The vacuum pump, which on this car is on the back, normally on transverse engines in VWs, it's gonna be on the side. As we look at this side, we're gonna be looking for any leaks or cracked hoses or pipes or anything like that. Everything looks good. The only concerns over here of common problems would be this uh, NAD valve or EVAT purge valve. I can tell you this has probably been replaced because it has screw clamps on it as opposed to squeeze clamps like these right here. That's gonna be what you normally would expect to find on there. Uh, and then the intake manifold has a flat motor that, that can, go bad and often did on the earlier versions of these FSI engines. Once they go bad though, they don't generally have problems again. So I suspect that also likely has already been replaced. Now we look at the ignition coils, I can tell you there are two new ones. They have Denso stickers on them. I'm probably not a big fan of those particularly. They're probably not particularly good value or quality. You can see the ignition coil connector here is literally not there at all. It's not even on there. So we did do a video on how to replace these. Uh, that's not particularly uncommon either. So is if you have a misfire, obviously that's a good place to look. And usually co uh, lower quality ignition coils that you would buy in an auto parts store are something I would highly recommend avoiding. Uh, pretty much stick with Bosch or factory and nothing else on those. Now we are gonna take a look here at the cabin filter because that's gonna be something that you potentially are gonna wanna look at as it's likely going to have some dirt in there. You can check the condition. It's something that you probably wanna replace and I can tell you from all the amount of Junk in here, this one's probably gonna need a new one too. Now the interior on this car is gorgeous. This thing is in beautiful shape. Interior and exterior are all very solid. Uh, that is not going to be a concern of ours on this car. Since we're in a state that doesn't require front plates, this particular cutout is kind of a pain and aesthetically not attractive. So on these particular grills, actually you can swap out, I believe just this front bar piece. And uh, on a lot of later cars, you have to swap out a complete grill, which a factory one is mighty expensive. Common problems to look out for on FSI engines. We've 
covered a bunch of them in this. We do have an article that links to the common problems for FSI engines. They're pretty standard across the, across the board in terms of common issues, but as long as you maintain your FSI, they're actually a pretty solid engine. Now, the timing belt on this car already has been done, so we don't have to worry about that. At 122,000, it's already been done, which means this thing can go many, many more miles without uh, worrying about timing belt, which is an expensive service. So good news about this car is I'm an idiot and it doesn't have a blown up transmission. It does still have the transmission issues. So we will have to address those things at some point if they continue to get worse. The vibration under load is something that uh, I actually talked to a buddy of mine who is an Audi tech. I'm not super familiar with CVT transmissions. Um, he told me, uh, his name is Steven, so shout out to him. He told me that the, the most common thing to do on these things is basically uh, you do a fluid exchange and re-adaptation procedure for a drive-off re-adaptation. And then uh, if that doesn't help, it's potentially a clutch issue. And then uh, in his words, he said, if that doesn't fix it, then it's a new car upgrade. Uh, and in this case, it would be probably a manual swap on this thing because it's, it's nice enough to probably keep around, but uh, not worth uh, trying to keep this constantly Velociraptor transmission going. Velociraptor constantly that the last Raptor transmission going. Uh, so yeah, there we have it. Uh, there's a video inspecting your car, B7 Audi A4, and uh, catch us next time.